fairies and goblins and gnomes, oh my, we're going to be playing a game where we're going to be meeting other mythical creatures at the crossing and trying to steal their stuff because that's the best thing that you can do when you're a little mythical creature. Yeah, we like shiny things like gemstones in this game. It's like going to the Disney store as a kid and seeing those fake precious stones in the middle and just being like, stones. <laughs> exactly. We're going to go over how this game is played and then we will be back afterwards after she has stopped cackling and we will give our thoughts on the game. Welcome to the rules section for crossing a game for ages eight and up, which should take about 15 minutes. And it's for three to six players. In the kingdom of Spamutel, humans, pixies, goblins, elves, dwarves, and fairies all live in perfect harmony. Sort of. Life is beautiful and simple in that kingdom, but on the day of the summer solstice, life stones appear on the giant mushrooms surrounding the small town of Crossing. Each race sends one of its inhabitants to the small town of Crossing. These stones are precious gems, so sharing isn't easy. No holds or bars included filching the stones gathered by the other players, so stay vigilant. Oh my. The object of the game is simple. Gather life stones in order to gain the most points. Setup is also super simple. Each player is going to choose a character, and they're going to take their little player character, and they're going to put it so the white border is facing up. Very nice. And anything that you're not using, which will be the case in any game that doesn't have six players in it, will go back in the box. Then we're going to take the mushroom tiles and place them in the center according to a chart that's in the book. So the number of mushroom tiles will change depending on how many players you have. For example, this is a three-player game, so I'm using two mushroom tiles. If I had four players, it would be three, five would be four, and six would be five. Then I place all the life stones in the bag. So these little gems I already fully set up, but you know these things that are not out here are in here in this beautiful bag. So black and mysterious. Ooh, shadowy and dark. Um, basically... After that's done, we're going to pick someone to distribute the life stones. If someone's actually a banker in real life, it is that person. If there is no baker, or banker, rather, I don't know why I said baker, <laughs> whoever has the nicest jewelry gets to do that job. Then the person who is chosen will put life stones on the mushroom tiles. So it's two per tile. And now the game is ready to commence. Now, on the first turn, and the first turn only, the players are going to count to three. On three, they simultaneously point at a mushroom, tile of their choice, with their fingy. If a player is the only one to point to a given mushroom, that player takes all the life stones which are on it and then places them on his or her character tile, so this thing. If two or more players to the, um, point to the same mushroom, nothing happens and the life stones remain where they are. And then the turn ends. So, for example, we're going to pretend that my hands are like Shoji's hands and my two fingers are actually multiple fingers, you know, from different people pointing at things. So let's say two people point at this one, one person points at that one, nothing happens here, something happens here, this person gets these. Swoop onto their tile they go, and then... The refilling action happens. There we go. Two, go there. And let's say there happens to be one left on a little mushroom tile, then one stone would go in its place. And if it already has two, not a happens, you don't need to refill. So this operation occurs between each turn until there are no life stones left in the bag, which triggers the end of the game. If there are not enough life stones left to supply each mushroom, the responsible player distributes them as he wishes, which means that some mushrooms might remain empty. Starting with the second turn, each new turn is played as previously explained, but players now have two new options. For example, there's filching stones. Instead of pointing at a mushroom, a player can point at another player's character tile. Ooh, ah, scary. If only one player points at this tile, that player may seal the life stones on it and place them on their own character tile. If two or more players are pointing at the same character tile, none of them take the life stones, which remain on the tile. So this is similar to the mushrooms, just with tiles instead of mushrooms. So basically, if I pointed here and no one else pointed there, I'm like, ooh, your stuff is mine now. Ha 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 ha. 
Furthermore, instead of pointing at a mushroom or at another character, the player can protect their life stones and claim them immediately. To do that, they cover their character tile with their hand. It's important to note that if another player points at a character tile protected this way, that's too bad for them. So, basically this. See this? This is the, don't you dare look at my beautiful life stones. Get your paws off. Get your eyes off. These are mine gesture. It's just like a basically like paws off kind of vibe going. And then these stones are removed from the tile and placed next to the player. They have now been claimed and can no longer be stolen because they're not on the exposed tile here. Players who claim their life stones then flip their tile over to the back where they, they're typically writing something very nice. It's a black bordered side, so that's how you know the difference. On the next turn, they will not play. They're on break until the following turn. At the start of the next turn, they flip their character tile back to the side with the white border and they can commence play again. So they'll just do that after the other two do a pointy and all is well. It's important to note that players are allowed to talk before or during the counting up to three to come to an agreement on the mushrooms to point at, or, you know, character tile if you want to be rude. But there's nothing from keeping you from breaking your word. So lie, be honest, do whatever you want, have fun. That's the point of the game, have fun. Uh, as I said before, the game ends at the end of the turn where the last lifestone is taken from the bag. And then it's time to tally points. So basically, you just go through this pointing and don't touch my things kind of process over and over until there's nothing left in this beautiful bag. I'm going to take some things out of the bag now to make it easier to show you guys how to score. So scoring is pretty simple. Each set of three stones of different colors. So basically, if you have one blue, one red, and one of this kind of orange-yellow color, it's five points. The white ones or transparent ones are worth two each. And each of the single ones, I need a single, I'm just gonna swipe this from this person, um, which couldn't fit into a combination of three is worth one victory point. Um, anything that's remaining on the life stones I don't currently, or anything that's remaining on the mushrooms rather, I don't currently have any life stones on the mushrooms are worth nothing to the players. Basically, the player who has the most victory points wins the game. In case of a tie, the player with the most white life stones wins. And if a tie still occurs, then you got to play again and find the real winner. So just to do things really quickly, if we were just to score up this pixie here, it would be 5, 10, 15, 20. Um, oh, no, here's an, an extra one, I think. I'm not good at organizing. Uh, so like I was saying, 5, 10, 15, 20, 25, 30. And then 36, 37, 38, 39. So this one would have gotten 39. I'm assuming they won, but, you know, not going to count because I feel like being a bum. And um, you determine the winner. And that's it. It's crossing. We'll meet you back up top in a minute to uh, give our final thoughts on the game. Okay, guys, let's be real. This is not a game for adults. This is a game for little folk and families. It's basically like, hey, let me take your stuff. Don't take my stuff. You can't have my stuff. Oh, I guess you stole my stuff. That's rude. It's just like a lot of pointing and like guessing. And it's just, it's very childish and simple and straightforward. I mean, the big benefit is it's budget friendly, it's family friendly, and it's fast. But it's not fun and engaging. For what, are, what are you talking about? This is heavy game theory at work here. This is mathematical principles and logic. I'll give you logic, but, and I guess math, because you have to count things and sort and stuff, but I mean, really, we're stretching things here. It's very much in the category of something like a finger guns at high noon, where it, that, it, one's fun. that one is fun. That's more fun than this, but it, it's where you're doing gestures and stuff like that. You're in this one, you're just pointing and finger guns. You, there's a whole bunch of different things you can do with your hands, you can cover but, things. oh yes, you Don't can, take my stuff. yes, you can point or you can cover things in this game. But you're, you're kind of playing more the other players than you are the game because you're just kind of determining, oh, are they going to protect their stuff? Are they going to be greedy? Things like that. You're just really kind of trying to figure out what the other players are going to do on a given turn and then just trying to optimize that. Yeah. I mean, I have to say, I do like the art. Like, I like a lot of the creatures and things like the characters ride on and the components are very nice. 
But like I said, as a game for adults and more seasoned players, um, gamers rather, nah, just not. Nah. Yeah, this is more of a game that you bust out with your family or your or kids, uh, like a group of kids at a camp or something. They'd have fun with this. It, it's not really something you'd bust out when you're just playing with your adult friends. But you know that doesn't mean it's not a bad game. It has this demographic, and I would definitely recommend picking this up if you have some like littler kids. They're like between the ages of what's the age range on here? Age eight plus. So yeah, like between eight and eleven, kid those that age kid would probably really like this probably more like even like five i feel like a five-year-old could play this easily yeah. six seven like to me like this is a game for like five to eight like ideally like i feel like by the time you hit like nine ten you're gonna get bored i don't know i think you can get some enjoyment out. i'm gonna recommend it for five to eleven year olds and and families if you have like a family with some kids that'd be pretty good so it's worth taking a look at it's it's not offensive. It's not complicated. It's easy to teach. It's quick. So if if the kids do like it, you can play a few rounds in a in a sitting. So that's our thoughts on Crossing. And if you like these game reviews and all this gaming content, and you like watching us in front of the camera wearing the same clothes doing multiple recordings, then please like that video, subscribe to the channel, and leave a comment down below. What is your favorite outfit that we wear? I mean, I'd love to know what you want to see more of. And have you ever played Crossing? Have you ever played any games like this where you're kind of gesturing primarily and it's not like moving pieces, you're kind of pointing at things? Or if you've played Finger Guns, it's another thing. And yeah, I already said to subscribe, but you can ring that bell so you know what's up and we'll catch you in the next one. Goodbye. I like just shoving the mic in her face and she has to figure out what to say.